welcome. I'm glad we've got such a great turnout. Um, my name is Susan McMahon. I'm the Associate Director of Wyndham Regional Commission. And the work I do predominantly at the Regional Commission is community development work as well as work on uh, brownfield sites. Um, Colin Mavis, I was Mavis. She's only been working for us for six months, so you know, no more than that now, but I still mess it up. She's a planner at the Regional Commission, and her she assists me on community development in brownfields, but she also works on energy issues. Um, about a year and a half ago, we applied to the EPA and the <coughs> National Renewable Energy Lab when we saw this grant go out it's really for technical assistance called the Repowering America Grant. And basically they were looking for places that had brownfield sites that was interested in energy generation. And we thought, okay, it's been a little bit while since the housing project was proposed for Basketville site. And we talked to the town of Putney, we talked to the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, we talked to the owner of the site, um, Greg Wilson, and we said, would this make sense? There's, can we look at this? Is there an opportunity here? We're not saying we're proposing a project. We're looking, is there a way to do energy generation at the site? So we were notified in like November, December 2011. I think we applied in May 2011. And um, the national, we were assigned a team from the National Renewable Energy Lab as well as EPA. EPA could make it today, uh, this, these days. But, um, Randy Hunsberger, who's an um, energy engineer, is that right? Yeah, renewable, renewable energy engineer. Renewable energy engineer has come out. He's been traveling a lot. He was out in Haiti just during the storm, too. So, um, But it took a while to get his schedule because he travels a lot for his work. Um, he's here for these uh, two days. He came last night, um, and he'll be here for summer t for tomorrow as well. And really what we're looking at is at the feasibility of energy generation. And particularly when we wrote the grant, one of the things we were looking at was combined heat and power. Um, we did say in the grant, the, the, uh, the application, that we wanted to look at alternative, other alternatives as well. Unfortunately, there was a limit to hours. So his prime area of expertise happens to be uh, biomass. But Daniel Hobus has been giving us and feeding us information about solar opportunities, and we'll try to gather as much. So tonight is really, there's no proposal on the table, absolutely nothing. What we're looking at is opportunities. It's an industrial site in your village, um, a former industrial site in your village, and we're looking at opportunities, and we're not saying that, the, that we are coming forward with a proposal. So I want to make that really clear. So what tonight is really about is letting you hear a little bit from here's quite from Randy about biomass, as well as really more importantly, hear from you. Um, so, and um, and I also want to thank Cynthia for helping us so much. Cynthia started the new town manager in Putney. Some people might not know her yet, so wave your hand. She's done a great job helping us organize this and getting this out to the public. So. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Colin and I will be, um, as we get to kind of the feedback part of the program, we'll be taking notes and I'll be helping facilitate that. Well, I hope you guys can see this. I know it's kind of small, especially here in the back. Is there any way to turn off the front and throw lights? Or? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, it's kind of dark back there. Yeah. That's for the white letter down, yellow letter Yeah, that's so you can't really read the light down. <laughs> Um, as Susan said, I, I've been traveling, I was in Haiti, and, and these guys set up all the meetings, and I actually didn't realize that this public meeting was planned until about lunch today, so I quickly put this presentation together, and the, the point of this is just kind of to give you an idea, kind of an introduction to biomass, as it says here, introduction to biomass, and uh, technologies, and applications. And uh, so it's, it's real short, you can go through it as fast as you want, but um, if you're doing a feasibility study for biomass energy project, these are just the things that you need to think about, or this is how I think about uh, these projects. So I start, you can start with feedstocks. So this lists some of the most common feedstocks. There are woody biomass, 
And I have those highlighted because that's really the most common pipe that, that we see. Uh, and that could be anything from a tree. You know, it could be the logs, it could be uh, processed into chips, it could be processed into pellets, uh, used as sawdust, and so on. And so there are reasons, uh, there are various reasons for using these different products depending on uh, what your goals are. Uh, you can use agricultural products, which can be residues, uh, for example. Uh, sometimes when you uh, harvest wheat, there's wheat straw left over. Sometimes when you harvest corn, there's what's called corn stover left over. And so those residues, you have to leave a certain amount on the farm. Uh, it, people tend to think this is just a free, free product, and it's really not, because there's a cost to harvest it, and uh, there's a, often valuable reasons to leave that on the fields. Uh, closed loop refers to something that you grow specifically as a bioenergy uh, crop. So it could be, uh, for example, a fast-growing switchgrass or, or a fast-growing willow or poplar. Uh, algae is another thing that's kind of on the cutting edge. That's not being done real commonly yet. Uh, I, I have these things here just for completeness, but we're not considering them. Uh, waste products, for example, municipal solid waste contains a lot of paper and cardboard, food scraps and so on that can be used to make energy. Tires doesn't really fit biomass at all, but it does have a lot of uh, energy. Uh, the, the products from here up are usually processed using thermochemical means, which means either you gas it or combust it. Uh, this area down here is really a biological process, uh, landfill gas uh, or anaerobic digestion. Uh, and these are used, usually used for wetter materials like uh, human waste, food waste, or animal waste. Uh, so sometimes you have a project and you start with a feedstock that you're maybe is a disposal issue or you just have an abundance of. Uh, sometimes you start with a need. For example, uh, these are very common things to use to do with biomass. You can produce heat or electricity uh, or, or both, combined heat and power. And this is really what we're focused on for this project. Uh, but you can also produce liquid fuel, gaseous fuels, and so on. Uh, chip sawdust and pellets are listed as a a product and they're also listed as feedstocks because the output from one product or from one project could be somebody else's input. Uh, so you need, to, you need to think about what feedstocks are available uh, and what their demands are. And in this case, uh, market refers to uh, who, who can you sell this heat or this electricity to? And so that's, these are the first things that we're trying to identify. Uh, who would be the users if we produce heat or electricity? and what feedstocks are available. But once you identify both the inputs and the outputs, now you can define your, your process. This, you know, this is like your factory. Um, and once you know these two things, then you can determine uh, how to get from, from the input to the output. Uh, so if you're, just, if you're making, just making heat, you can just use a pellet stove or a wood stove, for example, or a larger combustor and boiler. If you're producing Electricity, you need a, a steam turbine added to the combustor. You can also use gasifier with a gas turbine or engine. Uh, if you're producing pellets, there's a whole different set of equipment that you need. Uh, and, and then once you've defined all that, this little arrow really represents um, thinking about how are you going to collect that material? Are you going to uh, put out um, requests for, for bid for people to supply you with materials? Um, how is it going to be delivered? What kind of equipment? Because you have to make sure your receiving equipment is compatible with whatever the delivery equipment is. And on the other end, this little arrow represents how are you going to get your uh, stuff to market. So if, if you're producing electricity, for example, you might need to have a power purchase agreement. Uh, if, you're, if you're selling heat to uh, somebody off-site, you, you need to have some kind of metering arrangement and you need to have a contract for that. So that just represents all those things you need to do. Uh, in addition to the main <coughs> stocks, you have to look at what other things go into the process. Uh, you'll probably need additional energy in the form of electricity to operate pumps and motors and conveyors and so on. Uh, you'll need, you probably need some clean water, depending on what your process is. You might need a little or you might need a lot. Uh, there might be some additional chemicals. And biomass projects in general require a lot of people. Not a, huge, not a huge amount if you're just doing a pellet stove, but you need to think about what type of people will you need to operate your plant. Uh, so that's going to add some employment, but it'll also add to the cost of your project. In addition to the, uh, 
in, in addition to these outputs, you also have these kind of maybe less desirable outputs that are just byproducts. So they're error emissions. You have to determine what the emissions are going to be and make sure that you know that this system isn't going to be causing any kind of problems. Uh, you need to look at liquid emissions if you have a process that produces wastewater, for example. And then solid emissions, uh, biomass generally produces solid emissions in the form of ash. And ash from biomass, unless you're like using tires, ash is usually a pretty clean product and can actually be used as a soil amendment or, or sold for various products. What chemicals are, when you say energy, water, chemicals? Oh, these chemicals? Yeah. It all depends on this. So if you have, for example, um, it, it can get complicated, but if you have, for example, a steam turbine and you need to get your water real clean, because if you have a lot of minerals in your water, you might need to put some kind of chemicals in to clean up the water so that you don't foul your equipment. Uh, some, sometimes you need some other chemicals to reduce air emissions, for example. And it also, it really, it's really very dependent on this process. Um, and on top of all of this, there are two other things you need to look at. Uh, government and money. So government comes in in the form of what kind of regulations cover this equipment. Are there permits you need? Are there uh, renewable portfolio standards, for example, that may actually uh, allow you to sell electricity or heat for a higher value? Uh, so you need, to, you need to kind of look at all that as part of the feasibility study. And then money is really something we usually don't like to talk about, but it's very important because all this stuff costs money. You have to pay the people, you have to buy all this stuff. And you need to make sure that you're going to get enough money back to cover all that and make a little profit. So the economic analysis is a very important part of the process. So that was, that was a real brief overview of, of biomass projects in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'll just show you. I think I've only got three more slides, just a few pictures, and you probably can't see it from the back anyway, but this is just large-scale biomass heating system. So here's the firebox, here's the boiler. Uh, you can see that there's kind of a lot of stuff. You have the fuel coming in over here, uh, coming up this conveyor, and, and so on. So there's a lot of little pieces uh, that you have to consider. This one's even more complicated. This is the biomass gasification system. This is from Gusing, Austria where they're actually taking the biomass, converting it to a gas, using all this complicated equipment, and running it through a gas engine to create electricity. And heat. That's combined heat and power system. And here is just as an example of a pellet plant production. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff. You have to start with sawdust, and you have to dry it, and so on, compress it, and um, put it into bags. And this is, the this is my last slide. Uh, what this is attempting to show you is that um, the main purpose of a feasibility study is to reduce uncertainty. So if you're over here, and, and these numbers don't really mean anything. I just made this just to try to make this picture. But if you're over here at zero uncertainty, which you can never really get to zero, uh, that's, that, that's the direction you want to head. And you start way out here. And then these rep lines represent the value of reducing your uncertainty, and this represents the cost. So when you're way out here and you don't know anything, it doesn't take too much to start getting some valuable information. So at first, the cost to, do, to get some information is very small, and the value of it is very high. And as you get closer and closer to zero, the value of additional information becomes smaller and smaller, and the cost to achieve that becomes greater and greater. So there, there has to be a point where you Inside, you have enough information. The cost to achieve the more information is more than the value of it. And my point is that we're starting out here, and we're really working kind of in this area. So we're not, we're not working to reduce the value all the way here. This would be kind of an investment grade feasibility study, and we're going to be working kind of at this end of the curve. And that's it. So maybe first we can. Um just so, so I think there's some people that came in afterwards. Just to make it clear, there's no proposal. It's really, this is a technical assistance grant from EPA and the National Renewable Energy Lab to look at the feasibility of energy generation for this site. Um, 
So again, I just want to make sure to the people that came in, it's really just to learn. So, um, and Baskerville worked well for the application because you can just have a brown paper. But um, questions, I think, before we move on to, there's some chairs over there. Um, I was just, how is um, heat um, delivered and what is the geographic limitation? Well, generally, if, if you're delivering, for example, if you're delivering steam, you generally have some kind of insulated pipe. That pipe could be underground, uh, or it could be above ground, but if it's above ground, it has to be insulated more. Um, and so, if it's, if, if it's a steam customer, which for some reason they call a steam host, if it's a steam host that you're providing steam to, um, then you just have to know what their pressure and temperature and, and energy demands are, and uh, then you have to match that with your equipment. I mean, is there, is, is there considered a geographic boundary oh, limit? beyond which it's not economically feasible to deliver heat? Well, it, so it, it, it depends a lot on the cost of energy and the value of energy. So, for example, in Europe, they do a lot of what's called district heating systems, where they'll have a whole area, or even actually even in the U.S., a lot of cities, downtowns, tend to have these large district heating systems. Like, I think downtown Minneapolis might have one, and Denver has one, where they... Um, and, and so they, they distribute heat to various agencies using this kind of piping. Then you have a meter at each facility, just like if you're buying natural gas or something. So Lisa, were you asking that question to understand how wide into a village uh, something like that could Well, I, I just, I know nothing about, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if it was related to, okay, you have a bunch of buildings that you need to heat on site, and that's why you would produce heat, or if, you know, Yes. Or how urban a setting do you need in order to make it reasonable? Well, what, what becomes complicated is if you're trying to do like an existing, let's say if you're trying to do an existing neighborhood, that would be difficult because usually if you're looking at how individual houses, they have, they already have some kind of heating system that usually doesn't, isn't set up to plug steam into it. Uh, if we're looking at something like an industrial user, <coughs> then it becomes a lot easier. You know, just a single point of, of interface, really, or, or a couple. And since that question was asked, I would ask the question about the electrical as well. Because I think when National Grid upgraded their transmission line here, do you remember that? Well, we sort of told that they couldn't accept um, uh, electricity from solar panels or something like that. Would, would the electricity just go to the local substation controlled by Green Mountain Power and then it would be distributed to different people? How does that's, that whole thing that's work? That's often how it works. If you have a single large user nearby who you can work with directly, you could sell it to them directly. If your local utility has an interest in buying electricity, uh, you can work with them. For example, a lot of states have renewable energy portfolio standards and, uh, you, and the utilities in those areas are looking for sources of, of renewable mm -hmm. energy. Uh, in some states, biomass counts towards that. In some states, it doesn't. Uh, some states have a preference for something like solar. Uh, so that's that was part of where I had the uh, the government on top. Is that you need to look at uh, what the local regulations are and, and also what the local utility is interested in. And so that's really one of the big questions that we need to get answered: is is the local utility interested? And also sometimes there's you can wheel power, which means that someone over there wants to buy it, but you don't want to run a cable over there, so you run it to the utility, and then they're supplied by the utility, but then there's some fees for doing that. Because obviously the utility needs to make some money there. Exactly. Yeah. For handling it. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yes. Any question? Um, how, how much property is there, and, and how much property does a typical biomass plant need? You mean how much property is here? Yeah. Is it 6.1 acres? Eight acres. Oh, it's eight acres. Um, and because of all the different possible configurations and sizes, it's really hard to say what the typical plant is. Um, one of the big area, one of the big, one of the things that takes up a lot of area is the biomass storage. So if you if you have a need to keep like ten day supply on hand, you'll need a, a much bigger area than if you if you can get by with just a couple of days. And that's part of what you need to work out when you do the resource assessment is. How available is the biomass? Are there certain times of year where you can't get in, and so you need to have a larger supply? Like 
it, in Colorado, there's some areas you can't get over the passes in the winter, so they want to have you know two weeks worth of supply, for example. Well, following up on that, I assume that the most biomass plants generating energy, either heat or electricity, are not in the business of storing it. No, that's true. Okay. There's very little energy storage done in the U.S. currently, but a lot of it's <coughs> under investigation. You mean storing the chips or no, storing, no, storing energy? No, storing the energy, the product. Yeah. You need, to, you need to send it right away. Yeah, that's uh, really the whole U.S. grid is kind of set up that way. There's a little bit of pumped hydro here and there, and there's some <coughs> other kind of things, but we're really low on storage. And you also said that uh, the water requirements of biomass um, plants could be little or a lot. Can you give us a range or say why? Well, so for example, let's say you're producing electricity. You usually need to, um, if, if you have a steam plant, usually, uh, I don't know if you know the process for, for generating electricity from steam, but you, you need to, after you go through the turbine, you need to go to a condenser, and that condenser needs to be cooled. And so, to cool that condenser, you usually have a cooling tower, and that could be a wet or dry cooling tower. So a wet cooling tower means you're actually losing a lot of water to the atmosphere because it's evaporating water to, to cool that. So those, re those can require a lot of uh, water, and that's typically what a lot of the power plants around the country do. Like big coal plants usually use wet uh, cooling towers. And so those can use a lot of water just for cooling. You can do dry cooling towers, which aren't quite as efficient, but they use less water. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you can do to trade off water use costs, you know, uh, upfront costs versus O&M costs and so on. Mm -hmm. Looking at plants that already exist, do you know what the gallons per minute requirements no, are? No, unfortunately I don't. And, and right now we're at the very early data gathering stage, mm -hmm. so we don't even know which of those technologies is going to make the most sense or what size. Or, so, so that's part of the reason why I'm here is to meet with various potential users of the electricity or the heat to find out what size we should be doing our study in. And like I said, this study is going to be kind of generic so that we'll, we'll kind of find a size range that works and, and do the analysis for that, kind of this high level analysis. But it doesn't mean that that particular person or, or entity really is going to be purchasing the steam or the electricity. That's just something for us to kind of start with and, and look, look at the economics and see if it makes sense. What's the advantage of uh, using biomass over a solar installation? Well, this is one of those things where there's, there's trade-offs. So, uh, for example, if you look at solar, it, there's this term capacity factor which indicates how much of the potential energy uh, of the system size you could actually produce over a year. So typically a capacity factor for solar is going to be around 15 to 18%, which means if you have one megawatt of solar, multiply that by 8,760 hours in a year, and multiply that by about 18%, and that's how much electricity it produces. Uh, a biomass system has a capacity factor of maybe 85%. So for the same nameplate rating, you can actually produce a lot more energy throughout the year. Also with solar, you can't really turn it on or off. It's, it's non-dispatchable. So when the sun is shining, it produces electricity. When the cloud comes over or at nighttime, you're not producing electricity. Uh, in a way, solar is good because it tends to be producing the most electricity when the air conditioning load, for example, is highest. Uh, with biomass, it's just like a coal plant or a natural gas plant. You can more or less control the, the output and when it produces power. Um, another thing that's, depending on how you look at it, could be an advantage or a disadvantage is it takes more people to run a biomass plant and to supply the materials. So that's a higher cost item, but it also produces local jobs. With solar, once you put it in, uh, there's some maintenance, but it's not big. It, but you know your cost. You know in 10 years, you, you don't have any fuel costs. You don't really have a lot of operating costs. So it's more predictable what your economics are going to be over the long term. So when you do, and I'm assuming you'll do a comparison between the biomass and maybe solar, will you also include in that analysis things like, I guess I would call it social impact? 
as to the fit with the community? I'm thinking that there'd be a lot of trucks coming in and trucks going out under biomass that yeah, wouldn't be there with solar. And that's something I should have, should have mentioned. We'll try to do a comparison. For example, let's say that um, we're, we're looking at biomass for, as replacing fuel oil, for example, at, at one of the large users nearby. So you're going to have an increase in trucks delivering biomass, but a decrease in trucks delivering fuel oil. Uh, it won't be it won't be one to one, uh, and you'll also have emissions trade-offs. So, uh, for example, fuel oil often has sulfur in it. Biomass usually doesn't have sulfur, so you'll have different emissions profiles, different uh, traffic profiles, and so on. And we'll try to look at all those factors. And I should just also add, when we um, wrote this request for assistance, it, we really had a whole series of questions. I think that's why they liked it because. You know, at that point, biomass was being considered all over our region, and so we wanted to know, is it possible to generate electricity or heat within a village setting? I mean, because of the truck traps. So we asked a whole series of questions that were hopefully be applicable throughout the region, because we might find out, the study might show that it's just not acceptable in a village mm -hmm. setting. We learn more. Yeah, and, and our role isn't really to be a, an advocate for biomass. It's just to gather the data and put it into a form that the people who make decisions can look at that data, and then they'll make the decision, probably with input from the community, whether it makes sense to go to a deeper level of study or to pursue that farther. Oh. How many pollutants and so on are in the emissions of biomass? I, I presume solar doesn't have any. Solar doesn't really have any emissions, you're right. Uh, biomass, you typically have things like carbon, or carbon dioxide. Uh, there might be some particulate, but there are things you, there are emission controls equipment you can put on that will significantly reduce that. And what you have to look at when you look at the emissions, for example, is to look at the whole system emissions. So, for example, when I do a project in Colorado, I say, well, what are the alternative fate of that material? Because usually uh, the materials used for these projects would otherwise end up, for example, they pile it and burn it, you know, if it's, if it's a forest uh, fire mitigation thing. So either there'll be piled burns or controlled burns, or sometimes there's wildfires. In fact, in Colorado, there's lots of wildfires. And so by removing these things from the forest, you can actually reduce the wildfire risk and reduce the combustion in the forest. And uh, it generally reduces the emissions by over 90% uh, by putting it in controlled combustion. And so that's one of the things we'll look at is the overall reduction in emissions. I, I don't know for Vermont exactly if you guys are in the same situation in terms of dealing with these wildfire mitigation fuels. Mm -hmm. And the emissions in the immediate surround in the village. Yeah, so well. Because that could be different from the overall emissions. Right, yep. right. So that is something we have to take into consideration. So. Um, uh, in just going a little bit further with Hilda Marie's um, question about emissions, um, I, I live in the village, and a concern I have, um, and I wonder if the feasibility study can address this, is that we have um, seasonal, significant seasonal thermal inversions um, in the village, um, which really could affect the air quality if there are significant particulate emissions or or other stuff. I don't. I don't know enough about it. But just wondering if that um, that sort of climatic, like microclimate effect, is is something that you'll consider in your feasibility study. You know, that's a very good question, and I don't know if we'll get to that level of detail. But it's it's something that we'll address that needs to be reviewed if a further if a deeper study is done, because that usually requires kind of an air modeling expert, and um, they have to know you know how things. <coughs> flow around the hills and so on. And that's usually not a level we can get to in this study. Um, I just want to go back to the water issue since we're starting to write things down. Um, this, this site is uh, right next to the town well. And the town well produces 138 gallons per minute when it's maxed out. That's as much as it can generate for people who are hooked up to it. The uh, wetland and the freshwater ponds immediately behind the Baskerville site uh, pr produce, it percolates down, and it, and it provides about 95% of the water to the aquifer that feeds the town well. 
So the water source, how much water would be used and the water source and its impact on the town's water system and okay. its wetlands would be important. Okay. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have enough water, you don't have water. No, if there's not enough water, we, we wouldn't do it. Yeah. So, like I said, there, there are things you can do to, to reduce your water consumption and we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I came in a little bit late, so Susan, maybe I missed sort of an intro, but I'm trying to put some big picture together about the why of this, and um, I'm kind of struggling with this sense that the, the scale could be open-ended when uh, if there was some discussion about what we're generating and why we might be generating it, then this, the scale perhaps would, would fall into perspective. I'm thinking a little bit about the recent history of biomass electrical generation and the controversies in Massachusetts over both the supply and the issue about whether it was CO2 neutral in, in the combustion of materials. And that was on a big scale for sort of regional electrical production. And if we're taking a smaller scale, thinking about some autonomy in the village or, or some sense of self-sufficiency where we're interested in you know, an arbitrary target like supplying Putney's electrical needs, you know, the equivalent of that, or half of that, or its commercial needs, or something, you know, just some figure. Um, then I begin to, it begins to sort of fall together for me when it feels so open-ended that, um, you know, I don't think, well, I, speaking for myself, I wouldn't want to see a commercial biomass regional scale electrical generation facility on that site in Putney, I think it's an inappropriate I, site. We're, we're, that's absolutely, that's not the proposal, that we, we never said that it'd be, so, it was really more self-sufficiency village. Then is it, is it? <laughs> Is the act or the process of sort of establishing scale one that might be, you know, end up with uh, Putney having some electrical generation equal to its consumption? I mean, is that that would be a question for you? Yeah, and so that's actually what we're trying what we're trying to do. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I talked about here was finding a users for the electricity or the heat. And so we're trying to talk to specific people and see who might be a large user and might have some interest in either thermal energy or electrical energy. And so that's really the reason that, that I'm out here today is to meet with different people to, to try to nail that down, to try to define what the scope is. is it, but, but why? Um, is it because it's better environmentally because of lower emissions or, um, you know, greener in the sense of it being a sustainable energy source as opposed to a non-renewable energy source. Um, you know, what, what's the why behind it? There are actually a, a, whole, a whole bunch of reasons, and I guess different people probably have different motivations, but for example, if you're, if you're currently using fuel oil, and I don't know where that's coming from, but at least if you're using biomass, you're, you're putting money back into the local economy. So you have somebody nearby who's harvesting that material and delivering it instead of shipping it from wherever the fuel oil comes from. And so in a way it's it's grown locally, you're you're using a locally produced resource instead of one drawn in from uh, that's just one reason. Um, energy security for example. Uh, I understand there's a controversy about uh, whether biomass is carbon neutral and you can find papers on both sides. Uh, and that's probably not really something we'll address directly because it could be argued, you know, for a long time about whether it's really carbon neutral. But the question is, is it better than what it's replacing? So if you're replacing fuel oil, is, is biomass better than fuel oil? And I think most people would argue that it was. So solar obviously doesn't require fuel and there's a lot of components for solar. Uh, unfortunately, this study is pretty much restricted to biomass, but we're going to try to incorporate some information about solar in it kind of unofficially. <laughs> and why is it restricted? <laughs> well, this, this program through the EPA, each site had to pick one technology because otherwise it just gets out of hand. So each site was, each site was asked to pick technologies. In some cases there were more than one. And then, 
Yeah, so <laughs> several of the ones I've worked on, there, there were two or three different technologies they were interested in. And then uh, EPA and NREL kind of got together and looked at the sites and, and saw what made the most sense for each location. So for example, if you were in New Mexico, they'd be recommending solar. Here, you guys have one of the best biomass resources in the country. Um, so, so this site is actually a really good biomass site. Uh, and I guess that's, that's why you it. And, and like, like Susan says, it doesn't mean that you're going to do a biomass project. It just means that you're going to get this evaluation done and then, then you can decide which makes sense to you to do next. And we don't pay for the evaluation. No, this study is being covered by the EPA. Uh, I just want to add a piece of information here that people may not already have. There was an article the other day, which I actually have not read, about putting paper's consumption of fuel, and they are looking at the possibility of bringing in natural gas in order to do their drying processes, basically. They currently consume 1.6 million gallons of number six fuel oil at the Putney paper mill in order to do their drying processes. So yeah. if, if we were able with something like this to reduce significantly or eliminate the import of that 1.6 million gallons of fuel and or the emissions that are being put out by it, by having a suitably scaled plan that would probably be in everybody's best interest, whether they're in the village or in the region or anywhere else. And I just think that one of the really important things about what Randy is doing here is looking at scale and users. And, you know, I, I think that it's easy to talk about a power plant and suddenly say, oh my God, we're talking trucks and trucks and trucks, et cetera. Um, but when you think about what we're trying to supply and what the end goal may be, it, it may be a relatively small plant um, that isn't, doesn't have a huge impact and may offset a significant impact that already exists. So I just want that to be out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about how the grant or the RFP, whatever it is, uh, came out that you said the EPA in some regions, like New Mexico, stresses solar. In this region, they stress biomass. I wonder if I mean, it sounds like it can't because it's already a grant that's out, but whether the community might be interested in a feasibility study that would look at a hybrid model rather than a biomass model. Well, uh, because, because of this restriction that we could only evaluate one technology, there was one site that we're working on. We're doing biomass and they really wanted solar, so they came up with another chunk of money that they're paying us to do both studies. But that community is paying for that study out of their own pocket. And so it's, um, and it's really something that uh, hasn't been done before for us, so that this is something that we're just trying for the first time. So the community came up with some additional funds to, to pay, to integrate the solar study with biomass study. And that's an ongoing study? Yeah, that's just starting right now, also he's kind of running in parallel. And somebody else is on that. So on that can topic. we learn? I mean, I know it's very site specific, but is there stuff for us to learn from the other study? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us where that community is that's doing that uh, combined study? Um, is that not? I think it's Kansas City, Missouri. This was tied into brownfields. That was part of the restriction. What is the advantage of using a brownfield? Does the brownfield get cleaned up, or what is the? Well, the, the reason why, why the, the, throughout the nation there's a lot of empty brownfield sites that have no reuse for it. So EPA was looking at a way to do some energy that there's opportunity might be opportunities that are out there for doing energy generation on these sites. Um, and I think initially there were, there were a lot of, for example, capped landfills where yeah. you can't do anything else on top of the capped. And they thought, well, we could put solar there. And, uh, or maybe they could put wind turbines in a, in a place that wouldn't disturb the cap. Um, it, and you couldn't put like manufacturing, for example. But I think then they've expanded it out to, to cover other types of sites. And the other thing that, you know, we're, we're kind of posing the question, and obviously this is not his expertise, but are, if you were to do energy generation on a site, is there other um, light industry that would do well as part of it? For example, we were talking a little bit today about greenhouses 
and getting steam, if you went with combined heat and power and having steam for greenhouses during the winter. And so you can have food production throughout. Right, or, or an ideal one is the sawmill. The sawmill, yeah. So are there other, and I know we met with transition Putney folks and they gave us a list of stuff that they saw possible on a site like that. Granted, we don't own, your, own the site, but it's uh, exploratory. Can we find out how much a solar a feasibility study would cost? I can ask. Why don't you ask? Well, we'll pitch in half. I mean, <laughs> Missouri can pitch in half. <laughs> Share the data. I won't be happy to do it by population. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I'll have the solar tax. <laughs> Other concerns? Well, you obviously have access to the, the Brownfield study. Because we have. Oh yeah, they cause. We, no, 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 don't <laughs> worry. We gave we. He got more information than he's ever. Because that's, oh. that's something that should be capped, I guess, or certainly not disturbed. Um, right, just to clarify, what we found on that site was um, uh, pHs, poly. Polyamidic hydrocarbons, which is from incomplete bird uh -huh. burning. It's an, you know, it's, it was used as for an industrial site. It's not an unusual. In fact, any time we do any work in downtown Brattleboro, we find PHs. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, you know, sometimes it's from fill being brought in. It, it may have nothing to do with the use. Um, the reason why they were talking about capping over mm -hmm. when there was a housing study for that is that when people are living there 24 hours, there's a lot more of, of um, touching and you need to be careful with the soil. And um, it depends on the use and how you cap it. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're just finishing up a project um, we did a project, Brownfields and Cleanup Project in Algiers Village in Guilford, and we found contaminants and were able to actually remove everything because of the cost and it was housing. So there's different ways to look at it depending on what your use is. So that really, but I feel like we've tested appropriately and that's information. You've got stacks of it. Yes. Um, you mentioned sawmills just a moment ago, and, and were you uh, using those for an example of some beneficial industry that would also be able to provide a feedstock for the, the combined heating power plant? Yeah, in fact, I would say that this, this whole kind of biomass process got started at sawmills around the country because they had all this material, and they used to burn it in what was called a teepee burner, which is very dirty, and then as rules were put on that, they wanted to find other uses for that material, and they realized they had high heat loads and high electrical loads, so it just was a natural fit. Because we have a couple of sawmills in the area that generate a lot of sawdust and various other particles of wood, and would, would, would it be in your feasibility study scope to look at kind of closing the loop on having those sawmills actually provide raw material feedstock for the yes. plant? Yeah, we'll, we'll try to identify some of those as potential suppliers and, and even see if maybe they want to locate there. You know, which is a possibility. Yeah, and Bill would be a good person to ask when you meet with Bill tomorrow to look okay. about where yeah. some is the, the other person that's involved that's really knowledgeable about that stuff is Bruce Gardner from the Brattleboro mm -hmm. um, Development Credit Board. Right. And yeah. he's was there very as well versed in mm -hmm. the industries of the area and is already involved in this. If you're going to find a private company, would, would be interested in doing this, then obviously they're going to make a profit in doing this. They would want to do it for a reason, to make money, I presume. <clears throat> Why couldn't the municipality do well, it? Well, um, the municipality could, but sometimes there are, for example, tax breaks that if the, municip if the municipality is a non-taxable entity, those tax breaks may not be applicable to them. So there's some times where it's better for a taxable entity to own it. Is this have something to do with who runs our government? With what? <laughs> <laughs> it's the T word, right? Yeah, I'm getting political stock. I understand. You, to, to use a tax break, you need to have some income and a, right. a tax burden to begin with. And essentially, the higher the tax burden, the more valuable the tax break. Exactly. In other words, someone rich should own this. Right, if you're a nonprofit organization and you don't pay taxes anyway, that you don't get that tax benefit. So maybe for those people. But uh, nonprofit organizations use tax breaks all the time. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. In Vermont, we have quite a few tax credits that are able to be sold on the open market. And oh, really? So I wonder, I mean, and. and sort of like a housing development. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. that may, and so maybe put that down as a 
question mark is how how um, applicable is like an LLC nonprofit or an LLC developing a project and you can selling the tax tax credits. So we could do the research for you on that. Oh, they're a cooperative. <laughs> yeah, because yes. this community will bear the burdens of this if it goes ahead. And so why shouldn't we get the benefits rather than somebody who's just selling oh, it? Yeah, yeah there, there are a whole bunch of different ways to structure this, and it depends a lot on your situation and, mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, it, it, if the, we'll provide the information, and then people can look at it and decide okay, if they're interested. Okay, fair enough. In it. <laughs> so is the, is the basic um, assumption or you know, assumption that there's excess biomass in this region, and it's not, there's not a market for it? Or is it? Right. Or are we talking about evaluating what that market is and what's the competitive landscape for wood chips or whatever that biomass? Yeah, exactly. We'll have to look at. Um, we'll try to contact potential vendors and, and see if they have excess materials available. What the cost would be. All those kind of things. You know, what for the properties of the material? Is there seasonal variations and so on? So that that's something that needs to be included. The other discussion that came up earlier today related to that is the fact that the current use program in Vermont requires you to manage your property, and yet in Wyndham County, you basically cannot get a, you can't sell anything that's considered pulp material because the closest plants that use pulp material are northern New Hampshire, southern Maine, um, and New York. So the cost of trucking is prohibitive. So if you have to, in order to maintain your status in current use, if you have to manage your property by cutting otherwise unusable wood, what do you do with it? And that comes down to the question, you know, I mean, to draw a parallel to the Colorado question of preventing forest fire, we do actually have quite a bit of biomass that's produced and either just left to compost or burned because we need to get rid of it in order to stay, keep land sustainable by keeping them in production. And that's another good point. When you, when you do biomass on the ground, it, when it decomposes, it generally turns into methane, which is about 21 times stronger as a greenhouse gas than carbon uh, carbon dioxide. So um, there are all these things that are always balancing out. So it, it becomes really complicated. Yes? Would your feasibility study be willing to um, look at and record for our information? What kind of percentage? the pollution factor would cause, like we already have the pet mill, we already have the pellet um, system in, at PCS, so adding, especially right across to the paper mill, um, another pollutant, would that half again, would it double, would it triple, would it quadruple? Could you guys find that out and, and let us know? You mean quadruple the current level? The pollution level, yeah. If, if you particularly guys, with the particulates. If you guys have data on what you're currently producing, we could then calculate. Okay. What's PCS? I think the state that from, like, I know the paper mill at one point was producing more uh, fine particle than uh, it should, and it opted we, rather we than... We can look to find the data if there is if there's stuff before. Because they opted to pay a, a fine rather than reduce down to the state requirement level. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That was a long time ago. I mean, that was that's old news. And like they were allowed eight to years do old that? at least. <laughs> Seriously? Um, you've obviously got some people in the room who know a lot about local conditions and local concerns and the peculiarities of the village and also our history with new projects. And is there any chance that you would want to work with a committee of advisors who could keep in contact with you about these things? Well, there, are, there is kind of a group that is involved. I, I don't know exactly everybody's official role, but we've, we've had some meetings today with various people. Alec Daniel and uh, some others that have an interest in the project. I don't know everybody's role in terms of uh, how they're contributing, but it seems like there's a lot of interest internally in this project, and so we're getting a lot of local support. Okay. And, and it's not like he's going to take this information, do research, and he's going to come back with a bunch of talk to a little bit about the schedule. Oh, the stuff? So the, the next thing after, after this site visit, which ends uh, Friday, I'll go back and I'll write up a work plan, which will more or less state what the next steps are going to be, um, what's going to be included in the final study, 
Uh, and the final study, we're trying to get that out by January, uh, just a few months from now. So we'll, we'll send the study out to, uh, to Susan for review, and then uh, we'll get it back and finalize it. And so you should have it early part of next year. And it might make sense if there is a community interest that I wouldn't be the energy engineer, but we could have a meeting <laughs> just to, to discuss it, what we're finding out before we finalize it. Does, is that, would, do we time for that? It sounds... Yeah, the, the thing is, I, this is the only site visit I can do, so... Yeah, so you're not going to be back. I won't be no, back. No, no, I'm not asking you to come back. Because that's, you know, we have, it's a very small budget that we have to, because he's coming from Colorado, and <laughs> normally it only stays for a day, but we have such a yeah. beautiful community to stay <laughs> Is there an already existing town committee, like the Planning Commission, that he should be presenting drafts to? Well, he's working with the Regional Commission, BDCC, and the town, and so it's up to the town how they want to handle that. I think the other thing that we all have to remember is that this is a feasibility study. This isn't even a proposal. I mean, it's not, you know, basically what Randy's going to provide us with is information that's going to tell us that if we wanted to think about something like this, we could think about it. Um, and, and we're not even anywhere beyond that. We don't, Randy may come back and say, you know what, it's going to be too many trucks in town and you don't have a purchaser for the heat. It's not worth doing. So I think until we have this, we aren't, there's, there's no proposal, there's no plan to do this. It's just a question of whether we might be able to, and again, I'll remind people also that we don't own the property, we don't know whether the property owner would be interested in doing something like this. You know, I mean, it, it, he's clearly expressing an interest in working with the town on the usage of this property, but not necessarily in this capacity or any other capacity that's been defined. So. It's a really, really early, early step of the whole process. Yeah, but Josh, I would encourage us to stay involved because we all know how to eat and yet if it gets beyond us. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's getting beyond us. That's all I'm saying is that we haven't, we're not even anywhere to get beyond us. So. Yeah, I should also make the point. He was surprised when we scheduled this meeting, not, not that it, because he was just here, but I felt that it was important to be as tra transparent as possible early on, you know, what is going on. Um, and this could just be an interesting meeting and that's all it is for you all. I right. mean, that might be, we might find out, as you say, that this is just not doable. But we've learned something with that, too. Daniel, are you still uh, chair of the Energy Committee? I do, I am. There's a meeting, there's a meeting there's a Becky, yeah, with the Putney Energy Committee this morning, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, the Planning Commission has relied heavily on the uh, Energy Committee. Uh, we've been working on a rewrite of the town plan. So I, you know, I would think that that's a great relationship that you struck up with uh, the current chair of Putney's Energy Committee. Yeah, this has all been a Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> I, I guess to follow up on that, if, if there is town-wide interest in an actual project that involves energy on this particular site, then maybe that's something that we ought to have as, as a conversation in our community. And, and having Randy here is a great first step in looking at the feasibility of just one component of what that project might look like. So I want to thank Randy for coming here. and to a meeting that he really wasn't planning on. <laughs> <laughs> he was away in Haiti. He told me to schedule the meeting. <laughs> but I also want to thank Greg Wilson for letting us walk the land today and showing us around and being willing to be part of this whole process, which really, as a private landowner, you're not beholden to do. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other EPA grants that look at other things that you can? You know, I don't want to interesting grants. I want more. <laughs> um, I guess the community needs to let me know if there's stuff they would like me to look out for. So I think back with Daniel saying that perhaps it's, you know, I don't know. I don't think there's anything that we can think of that we would want to look at. But if you want to let me know, I'm happy to let you know. Well, I'm not saying that you can't look at it. I guess I would like some more feedback before we start looking for grants. But if you tell me what your needs are, I can always, you know, I'm a creative grant writer. <laughs> can, we, can we just do like a show of hands just so it really yeah. gets an idea about people that, that might be interested in seeing a combined heat and power plant on this site? Just raise your hand. 
Combined heat and power, meaning no, feasible. Biomass. Well, how can you answer that question? Yeah. Maybe you should tell us what a combined heat and power plant is. Okay, so can I ask you a question? I'd like to know one thing from you. You mentioned Kansas City. Have you worked on any towns the size of Putney? Or is it all big? Well, Kansas City, Denver. New York City. Have you ever done something for a small area like this? I, I have personally, but it was before I came to enter a life. There was a small community in the mountains of Colorado that was, and, and when he says uh, combined heat and power, this could be just heat or it could be electricity. And I've worked on some small towns where it was uh, heat only. And um, yeah, maybe maybe about the size of this, up in the mountains in Colorado. I used to live there. What's that? I used to live there. Oh, in the mountains of Colorado? <laughs> she left his biomass plant. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why I asked you. I was part of a process where experts came to give us advice in Putney and in southern Vermont. And all the experts were from Hawaii and of uh, Florida, and they absolutely did not realize that there were certain elements that were really important here, like rural and small, and inaccessible. And so that's why I'm asking you if you've ever dealt with small towns, because they were used to Oahu or whatever and Miami. So that's all I was asking. I also asking. want to make it really clear when we put in the technical assistance grant, we made it really clear that these are small towns. Right. I mean, Remember, we had a list of questions all related to being a small, small village. Because yeah, so. it's not Kansas City. Yeah, so we, the, right. I, I, I need these questions answered as well. And I, yeah. We so need. Was this all your idea? <laughs> 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 this all your idea? No, it wasn't all my idea. It was my, I. <laughs> the, it was an opportunity. I brought it, as anything that comes out to my desk, I brought it forward to the town of Putney and Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation and the Energy Committee. Well, the opportunity to question this grant. This grant. This grant. This is a great so you got a grant. Well, well, tech, it's, tech, it's tech, tech, no tech, money to nope. receive, but the, this gentleman and a whole team of people behind him will be working on this and possibly on other things if we Come up really with show money. that we're interested <laughs> in things. So it, it's again, we're not bringing forward a proposal. We're just looking at opportunities. Susan, yes. Um, that sign-up sheet that you have out there. Once we have a show of hands, if there are people that are interested, can they sign up on that sheet, and we can uh, use that as a collective? Or they can put a star next to their name, maybe. Would that help you? Something. Yeah. Sure. And if you haven't signed in, thank you for reminding me. Please do. Susan. Okay. I'd just like to make an announcement if I could. I'm, I'm Pamela Covich and I'm on the Energy Committee. Um, and anyone who is interested in working on energy issues in Putney, we're open. Um, we're an open ad hoc group. We're actually not appointed by the town. So please join us when we have a meeting. Um, and let Daniel know if you want to, if you're interested or you just want to come check it out. Um, and he'll put you on our email list. It's an open group, and we um, work in service to the community. So the bigger, the better. Was there a question about what is combined heat power? Yes. Maybe that explains. I mean, just briefly, you can produce heat only. So, for example, if you if you had a building you want to heat, you can just provide you can just produce uh, heat. You can produce electricity only, which is what most power plants in the U.S. do. They just produce electricity and throw away the heat. But combined heat and power gives you an opportunity to produce electricity and heat at the same time. And there are a whole bunch of different ways to configure that if you want to make mostly heat and less electricity, or mostly electricity and less heat or solar. And so that's, if you're doing combined heat and power, it's important to know ahead of time what those loads are going to be so you can optimize your system design. Is that kind of a brief explanation? Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Well, thank you.